Okay, so when we talk about abdominal wall, we start with rectus abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique, and transverse abdominis. So those four muscles represent what we call or refer to as your abdominal wall. The second two muscles, so as major and iliacus, those would not be considered abdominal wall muscles. So I want to clarify that so when you get questions regarding abdominal wall or there's discussions regarding abdominal wall. Um, Karnisha, are you in? It keeps, looks like it keeps popping you up in the waiting room. I have, now, now there's two Karnishas. Are, are one of you here? All right, I'm going to assume yes. Okay. Um, so as major and iliacus, which are not considered abdominal wall muscles. So anyway, the, the point of that to start with is that when you get questions regarding abdominal wall, yes, good. Um, abdominal wall, it's going to be in reference to one of those four initial muscles, not so as an iliacus. And we access so as an iliacus with our hands through the abdominal wall, but they are not abdominal wall muscles. Okay. Um, so we're going to start <clears throat> lecture with our abdominal wall muscles, excuse me. <clears throat> and we're going to start with rectus abdominis. Okay. Rectus abdominis is probably the, the easiest abdominal muscle to comprehend. Um, so uh, we're going to be right here uh, in the front of the torso. Okay. We're going to be starting with the, okay, that's fine. We're going to start with the fifth, sixth, and seventh rib. So this is going to be the location of origin for this muscle. Um, as it travels down to insert on the pubic bone, anterior pubic bone. It's a very vertical muscle that's running from the pelvis straight up to where you would imagine a straight line attaching into the rib cage. Um, and the only thing that this muscle does in terms of actions is spinal flexion. So if you can imagine somebody doing a sit up or you can imagine somebody folding forward to touch their toes, those are all going to be things that rectus abdominis does. Um, and this, this, so I'm going to pause for a second sidebar with you guys, which is that you're going to hear this movement in a couple of different ways. You're going to hear it as spinal flexion. You're going to hear it as torso flexion. You're going to hear it as trunk flexion. I don't know if this has confused anybody so far. And I kind of tried to mention this in the videos, but they're all the same thing. You know, the trunk, the torso, the spine, they're all part of the same region that's creating motion um, with these muscles. Okay. So don't let that throw you off <clears throat> and go ahead and just start repeating that in your head. So when I'm talking about what rectus abdominis does, I can describe it as spinal flexion. I can describe it as torso flexion, or I can describe it as uh, trunk flexion, all three totally appropriate. Okay? I have a, a request. Can sure. you show on your model the movement? I'm so visual. It helps tremendously. So you said, yeah, um, so I can do it on me, which, okay. which um, <laughs> Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm standing here, right, and we look at the spine or the ribs or the trunk, if I fold forward, that's going to be spinal flexion. So I'm bringing my rib cage, the fifth, sixth, and seventh rib specifically, down towards the pubic bone. Excellent, thank you. Yep. And so that's the other thing with this group, and, and I always try to get it right with Kyle's book. Um, so... There are some muscles in the abdominal wall that insert on ribs, and there are some that insert on pelvis. Um, now, this, this gets a little bit confusing in that um, really all of, you know what, Let, let's come back to this. There, this can get very interesting, and I don't know if this has crossed any of y'all's minds so far, but we know insertion is where movement is happening. So uh, there are some benefits to how it's arranged in Kyle's book but it does leave a little bit of confusion. So um, I'll come back to that. Let's go through all the muscles first, then I'll come back to that. Um, that which, why, why the origins are what they are and why the insertions are what they are. Um, okay, uh, so that's rectus abdominis. It is a trunk flexor. And again, you'll notice that it is a compressor of the abdominal contents, which isn't so much an action, but more of a function that your abdominal muscles do passively. So at any given time, <clears throat> your abdominal balloon has a compressive force available in it. And it's a compressive force that is very different than your thoracic 
compressive force, um, the pressure inside of those cavities, so to speak. And the differences in those pressures allows for organs to sit where they do and the functions to continue the way they're supposed to. Uh-oh. Sorry, guys. My daughter was running through with loud volume on her phone. You clear? Okay. Okay. So when we talk about intra-abdominal pressure, abdominal force going through the abdominal wall, this is something that our body does functionally without having to think about it. So it's not like flexing our spine. Like we have to think about that and consciously do it. But intra-abdominal pressure that's something that our body naturally does all the time. Now, we can increase that pressure. Um, and I gave you guys a few examples like breathing with pursed lips or um, anytime we're creating uh, more than usual effort, right, we'll feel that pressure increase in our abdominal wall. And that's good because it's good for the organs. It's good for spinal stability. Um, and this can be done properly and improperly. Um, so sometimes we can feel that reality in our system and we'll feel when we're increasing intra-abdominal pressure, we'll feel our abdominal wall working, we'll feel it contract, okay? And this is often referred to as abdominal bracing would be the term that we would use, abdominal bracing, but that's compressing the, the abdominal contents and our abs are doing that all the time. So people that have um, soft belly presentations, not in a good way, like there's a good soft belly and there's an unhealthy soft belly. You know, really unhealthy soft bellies can present with um, organs out of place, they can present with um, a number uh, or a variety of visceral issues. There's practitioners that work with this, um, and this can happen under a number of different circumstances. So um, not, not for us to discuss right now, but just want to just talk about what that is because some people get confused. But all four of your abdominal muscles will contribute to this. So uh, this, is, this would be considered a common function of all abdominal muscles, compressing the abdominal contents. Okay, but other than that, just flexion of the spine, torso or trunk, that's gonna be all that rectus abdominis does. Okay, so it's probably the easiest abdominal muscle. If we go from there, we have our pair of obliques. Now, how do y'all feel about obliques right now? You've had a week to sit with the videos. Um, I'm gonna run through the material on it, but how do you guys feel about um, the obliques so far. Do they make sense to you guys? Y'all didn't seem to be too overwhelmed with them at the time, but now that you've sat with them, do you feel like they're confusing? What do you think? I think it's sinking in. I still think there's a lot for more for us to absorb. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quick question. Okay, sure. What's up, Brian? So on the book, like the uh, the obliques are like look like they're like kinda on the serratus a little bit. So is that, is that where they insert it or is that where the origins at? And they still, or like, or like, in, like it's hard to, I don't know, like, like I'm trying to get a visual representation of it, but like on the book, it seems like it's showing it like it's basically the serratus, like it's on top of the serratus. So um, that's, that's a good point. So one of the facts that you're going to have to remember in this particular chapter is that the external oblique and the serratus anterior <clears throat> do what's called interdigitate, which means that they are two muscles that are continuous with one another. So um, you see this in like the really extremely fit population. It looks like one muscle all the way from the abdominal wall underneath the scapula. And that is, uh, that is the interdigitation of those two muscles. So um, your eyes aren't playing tricks on you, man. They, they, are, they are intertwining because External oblique is on the lower eight ribs, but serratus anterior is on the upper nine ribs. So there's right. a massive amount of intersection between these two muscles. Okay, so to make it easy, the obliques kind of start lower eight. The external obliques. Yeah, lower lower eight, and then the we'll we'll, we'll see that the serratus is upper nine ribs. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, yeah, great question. We'll come back to that for sure, Brandon. That's, that's something that we will, we will highlight when we get serratus. In those yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, lower eight ribs. So, this is going to be the origin. And this is, this is what I mean. Um, you know, having the lower eight ribs as an origin, is the ribs the more stable attachment or the more mobile attachment? That, that's, a, that's a question we'll come back to. Something for you to think about right now. But lower eight ribs as your origin. Okay, so five through 12. The insertion is going to be into the abdominal fascia. 
the linea alba and the iliac crest. So the fiber direction is running from lateral and superior to medial and inferior. Kind of like if you were putting your hands into your pockets this way, okay? And the fiber direction, again, it's really important in terms of what we expect these muscles to do in rotation, how we expect them to rotate the torso. All right, so flexion of the trunk and torso, it does that along with rectus abdominis. It will also laterally flex, which would be um, the same as side bending. So if I side bend my torso, that's lateral flexion. It's involved in that. We also know it's going to be compressing the abdominal contents because all abdominal wall muscles do that. But the rotation is where it gets tricky. So lower eight ribs into the abdominal fascia linea. So we'll, we'll, we'll focus on my left external oblique right here. This is my left one, okay? It's going to be pulling the lower eight ribs into the midline. So even though this muscle's on the left, it's going to be pulling the ribs towards the right. So I'm going to, if, if I fire, if I shorten my left external oblique, I'm going to get rotation to the right. And if you guys stand up and pull your belly button towards your spine and rotate to the right and really let your abs do the work, you'll feel that external oblique working on the left side. So is that medial rotation? So the thing with the spine, Gene, is there is no medial or lateral rotation. Remember, there's okay. only rotation to the right and rotation to the left. Thank you. Now, um, and this is good. Some other people might be thinking this as well, but this is the first place that we don't have medial and lateral rotation. We have, we have the midline itself. So there is no towards or away from the midline anymore with the spine. It's only to the right or to the left, which while that seems more simple, the way we describe muscles that move the spine is either they're pulling to the opposite side that they're on or they're pulling to the same side that they're on. Um, and this, this is just a way to describe what we expect muscles to do in terms of movement on the body. Right? If I'm looking at a muscle like an external oblique and it fires, I need a way to be able to describe to somebody what happens to the body so that they can see that. Now, I can't say that external oblique rotates to the right because it rotates to the right and the left. So does an, any, any rotator of the spine is going to rotate to the right and left because they're a pair. There isn't a muscle in your body that just rotates to the right or just rotates to the left. So I can't use that terminology to describe to somebody what that muscle is doing. But what I can do is say, well, external oblique rotates to the opposite side. That means that the one on your left, when it fires, it's gonna take your body and turn it to the right. And if the one on the right fires, it's gonna take your body and rotate it to the left. That way you have a visual of what those muscles are doing. And not only do you have a visual, but you can then look at a body in space or look at a body in movement and see a rotational dysfunction and say, oh, well, I know what muscles are involved in that. So that, that's the goal with it. And this is where obliques get very confusing because this concept is not easy at first. So um, is that contralateral? So another term for opposite, yes, would be contralateral, correct. Okay. Yep, same side would be ipsilateral. Yep. So um, does that make sense? Gene or still very confusing? No, it's starting to gel. Good. Yeah, it takes time. It really does take time. So don't, don't worry about it. It takes time. And, and I have, referring back to your quiz, that's part of what tripped me up is not understanding the movement and the origin and how you put frame the questions because you there's no one place to look it up to say, oh, okay, it's this or that. You have to think through it. Correct. And, this, and what you're doing now is helping. Good. And I think going through the quiz will too. So, you know, with those questions, you can look through your book, but, and you can find the information, but you still have to apply a thought process to it. And I think mean, that's, that's, um, that's where therapists become clinicians is when they can do that, when they can look at a body – and put all the pieces together into a solution. That's, that's really you know, what that's building towards. So. Good. For the insertion, do we have to know all three insertion points or just? Um, um, on yeah, the yeah, so, uh, so here's the thing. There, if, you, if, you look through, if you look through, Patty, at all three um, insertions for internal oblique, external oblique, and, and transverse abdominis, 
you're going to notice that all three of them have abdominal fascia in linea alba as their as part of their insertion. Right. So, so that's helpful. Yes, I would remember all three of those. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, good question. Um, and I think that's why uh, Kyle designed the attachments the way he did, so that there's a common insertion for all three of those because um, it's a lot of information, right? I mean, those three muscles right there, it's a lot of information going on. Uh, hard hard to, to really compartmentalize all of it. So uh, that piece can help. So, so you'll see abdominal fascia and linea alba come up for um, the next three muscles, external, internal, hydrate. So, okay, so next we have internal oblique, which is very similar to external oblique, internal oblique is, but different fiber direction, okay? So it is going to take its origin on the iliac crest, as well as what um, we learned in the video is called the inguinal ligament. Inguinal ligament runs from the ASIS down to the pubic bone. So it's a, a ligament you can palpate on yourself. It's typically very, very tight. Uh, so it's going to be right through here as well as the iliac crest. So this muscle is really starting down into the anterior and medial pelvic girdle. And then it's going to head from inferior and lateral to superior and medial. So it's going to come up and into the abdominal fascia linea alba as well as some vertical fibers up into the lower three to four costal cartilages, okay? So it's, it's got, and this is important, both of those muscles have a little bit of, of verticality to their muscle all the way to the outside, and that's what allows them to be lateral flexors. Okay? They are able to laterally flex, they're able to flex the trunk with rectus abdominis, although they're not gonna be, you know, if you go to the gym and do sit-ups all day, straight sit-ups, you're not gonna get very strong obliques, are you? You got to do like rotational stuff to get your obliques going. I mean, they're, they're pretty much rotational muscles, but lateral flexion would work. Lateral flexion is um, something that the obliques do better than people assume. Um, and I mentioned that because when you get into working with scoliosis, you can't forget those obliques, man. When you get really strong um, side bending patterns in the spine, you have got, I mean, those obliques have got to be included. I mean, they are such strong contributors to that pattern, in my, in my opinion. So uh, legitimate vertical fibers for that lateral flexion. But again, the rotation is where people get confused. So um, we had external oblique. We talked about the left one coming across here. Well, now we have an internal oblique that's coming down this way, or really up this way. And they're kind of meeting in the middle like this, if we're doing a right internal with a left external. So right internal, inguinal ligament and iliac crest up to the abdominal fascia, linea alba, and lower three to four ribs. Okay, when that muscle fires, it is going to rotate to the right. So we have a, a muscle on the right side of the body that's going to rotate to the right. So would that be a same side or an opposite side rotator? Well, that would be a same side rotator. Same side. Yeah, because the one on the right is rotating to the right. Side bend is a great stretch for obliques. Yeah, so side bending is a really great stretch for, for a number of muscles in that complex, including obliques. If you really wanted to maximize um, oblique attention, you could do a side bend with a rotation cailing, and that would really help to open up obliques a little bit more if you added those two together. But yeah, side bending in general, yes, it's just good for that whole lateral complex of muscles, QL, erectors, obliques, could get any of them. But, you know, you can position more posterior, anterior, more rotational, and it could target some of those muscles a little better. Awesome. Thank you. Um, no and problem. so for the fiber direction on the internal oblique, uh -huh. um, in saying it the same way that you said it for the external, it would be running from lateral and inferior to medial and superior. For internal oblique, yes. Lateral and inferior to medial superior, correct. Awesome, thank you. No problem. And then external oblique would be superior and lateral to inferior medial. Yeah, so it's running that way. So, so they're creating, so in essence, guys, how you wanna think about these functionally is that, oops, sorry about that, um, is that the left internal works with the right external and the left external works with the right internal. So the, the opposites across the body are synergists with one another in rotation. And that's, and that's where it's weird because, you know, 
if we have a muscle on one side that's an opposite side rotator and a partner muscle on the other side that's the same side rotator, then they're going to be working together. Okay? Because if the one on the left is going opposite and the one on the right is going the same, well, they're both going to be creating right side rotation. So they are synergistic in that way, um, which is much harder to hear and much easier to see. Like when you see the external and internal drawn together, you're like, oh yeah, that looks like a belt across the body. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. So hopefully you guys can sit with those images and it starts to make a little more sense. Um, but like I said before, this is a really difficult part of muscle anatomy is the abs. It's really tough. So, um, so let me recap those two really quick, okay? So external oblique is going to originate on the lower eight ribs. It's going to insert on the abdominal fascia, linea alba, and iliac crest. It's going to perform trunk flexion, lateral flexion of the trunk, and rotation to the opposite side or contralateral. All right, David, can you start over? My computer just glitched. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No problem. So external oblique originates on the lower eight rib. It inserts on the abdominal fascia, yes. linea alba, and iliac crest. It performs flexion of the trunk, lateral flexion of the trunk, and rotation to the opposite side. Internal oblique takes its origin on the iliac crest and inguinal ligament. It's going to come up to insert into the abdominal fascia, linea alba, and lower three to four costal cartilages. It is going to also flex the trunk. It is also going to laterally flex the trunk, but it's going to be a same side rotator or what we call an ipsy lateral rotator. So that's where the two are different in their movement is the direction they rotate to. So again, um, you'll just have to sit with those two for a while, guys, and just keep imagining it. Um, I might try to put together like a movement video. We have a number of weeks in ATC, guys. I mean, we'll have plenty of time. So, um, so yeah, we'll have time to go through this. Yeah, not wait till it's in person. It helps a lot. Oh, man. So, yeah, so much better. So much better. And there, there is, again, some great elements of doing this virtually. And uh, I think especially being able to create content that can be viewed over and over is of, I mean, it's got its benefits, but yeah, live is the best. There's no, no question about that. So, and if everybody does their job, you know, we should be back and swinging pretty soon next couple of weeks. So they're saying, they're saying we're like 79% um, doing a good job with staying in the house. Yeah, that's good. Like stopping yeah. the spread. So, you know, we may be that lucky, the lucky state to get back going. I'll use it, man. That's for sure. If not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make it, y'all, for real. It's tough, man. You'll make it, though. You're strong, Nautica. You can, you can make it. Okay. That leaves us with one more abdominal muscle, which is transverse abdominus. Now, what you might notice is that the origin for transverse abdominus starts the same as internal obliques in the inguinal ligament and iliac crest. So, so far, same origin, but it includes this thoracolumbar aponeurosis. So it literally wraps around to the back and up this thoracolumbar fascia here in the spine. And then the fibers are going to wrap around to the front to insert on the abdominal fascia, linea alba, and pubic bone. So it's literally like a, like a balloon or a corset between the ribs and the pelvis. Yeah, girdle. Huh? A girdle, yeah. A corset is a great, if you look up a corset, if you don't know what one is, that's basically putting on a transverse abdominus. That is what transverse abdominus does. And when it's healthy, that's what it does. That's why people who have good TA activation and they do tons of Pilates, they have that, that hourglass figure, uh, at least if we're speaking of women, because they have that really tight transverse abdominus kind of pulling everything towards the center, um, which is what, of course, it does. But that's the job. That's what TA does best. Um, and in doing that, it is considered uh, to only compress the abdominal contents, uh, which is what all abdominal muscles do, but it is, uh, 
it is very good at that. That is your prime muscle. So when you have people that have issues in this, this realm, TA, transverse abdominis, is really the big target of attention to get them uh, therapeutically better. Uh, transverse abdominis. So those are the abdominal muscles. Um, a couple of bullet points to mention. Um, again, when you look at a muscle, to go back to the book, when you look at a muscle like external oblique, and this is what I was talking about earlier, having the lower eight ribs as the origin is a very odd thing to me, um, based on the principle of what origin and insertion means, because it's definitely the ribs that are moving more than the pelvis and midline, right? You're going to be moving your ribs around your pelvis more than your pelvis around your ribs. However, the one benefit of having it written that way is that you have a common insertion for those muscles, which is going to be abdominal fascia and linear. So use it to your advantage. So if we kind of push rectus abdominis to the side, which I think is a pretty easy muscle, and we look at the remaining three muscles, if we, if we look at the insertion as the abdominal fascia and linea alba, we really just need to add one thing to each. Okay, so for external oblique, if we look at insertion, if the one thing we add to abdominal fascia and linea alba is iliac crest. If we look at internal oblique, the one thing we add to abdominal fascia and linea alba is lower three to four ribs. And for transverse abdominis, the one thing we add to abdominal fascia and linea alba is the pubic bone. So it's one addition to that abdominal fascia, linea alba insertion for each of those three muscles. Hopefully that made sense, but that's an easy way to think about compartmentalizing the insertions for those three. You'll also notice that with the exception of transverse abdominis, rectus and your two obliques all have some association to ribs. So this could be another uh, little trick to think about is when you think about ribs five, six, and seven, which abdominal muscle do you think of? When you think of lower eight ribs, which abdominal muscle do you think of? When you think of lower three to four ribs, which abdominal muscle do you think of? So that might be to your advantage to, to, to connect the rib attachments with the said muscle. That way, if it comes up in a question, you know, oh, low, five, six, and seven, that's rectus abdominis. Lower three to four, that's internal oblique. Lower eight, that's external oblique. So tying those together can be quite helpful. But those are about the only common pieces you can bring together. This is just a group you've got to spend some time with and memorize. And try to imagine, I mean, they're, they're difficult muscles, like I said. Any questions on the abs at the moment? Okay. That leaves us with psoas major and iliacus, two extraordinarily awesome muscles that, uh, but man, I'm telling you, psoas and iliacus probably pay my mortgage, man. I mean, those, those guys are problematic. People have no clue how to work them most of the time. Um, I mean, it does take some practice. And uh, yeah, you can't go wrong, man. Psoas work is so nice. Iliacus and psoas, both very, very good. So if we look at psoas and iliacus, uh, there's some things about the two of them that you can learn as a unit. The first is going to be the insertion. They both share the same insertion on the lesser trochanter of the femur, okay? Which is on this inner surface, proximally on the femur, lesser trochanter. They're both inserting there. Um, you, At some point in your life, maybe you suffer from it, something called internal snapping hip. I think we may have talked about this last week, but internal snapping hip, that's so as tendon, man. Usually it's rolling over this lesser trochanter. Sometimes the iliopectineal eminence, but that's that. When people have that really loud popping sound on their inner thigh, it's usually so as tendon. Is that usually a referral? The snapping? Yeah. Very local. That's local to the structure. So they get, they get popping in that area, and that is a problem of the tendon as it relates to the bony attachment. Okay. Um, um, and it can create growing pain. You can get something called... Uh, psoas tendinopathy, which would be a result of excessive and um, negative friction in the area. So, uh, but that wouldn't be necessarily a referral. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would just be like a local condition. I wouldn't even call it a pathology. Most snapping hip presentations are asymptomatic. There's no symptoms. They just, they can make a pop. 
very audibly. Like you'll hear it pop. Okay, so lesser trochanter, common insertion for both psoas major and iliacus. So what's going to be different is their origin. For iliacus, it's easy. It's the iliac fossa, okay? So this is purely a hip muscle. It's only crossing that hip joint. That's all it's affecting, um, and that's it. But psoas is crossing all the lower spinal joints as well because it's up on the body's discs, and transverse processes from T12 all the way down to that L5 junction. So really strong influence on the front of the lumbar spine. Uh, this makes psoas um, such a unique muscle. It's ability to be in direct relationship with the lumbar spine, a place that people really struggle with. Okay. Now, both of them are considered to be hip flexors. So flexors of the hip, hip flexors. Okay. Iliacus is going to be your primary. I mean, it's there's no better muscle suited to do it. It's deep, it's big, it just crosses that hip joint right in the front of it. I mean, this is this guy is positioned to be very, very good at hip flexion. Um, so as major is considered to be active beyond 90 degrees. So once you're beyond 90 degrees, you get more of that so as um, major influence. So it's still considered a hip flexor, but more so than anything, it helps to maintain lumbar lordosis. So maintaining a healthy lumbar position. Um, some people might just describe this as uh, so as major is a stabilizer of the lumbar spine. That's fine too, because that's what stabilizers do. I like the other description better because, you know, when people say, oh, a group of muscles stabilizes a joint. I don't know if you guys realize this, but certainly for me, that's not telling me anything. I mean, it's telling me that they're playing some passive role in the joint, but what, is, what do they mean by stabilizing? Are they keeping the relationship of the joints true? Are they managing the picker? Are they decelerating the joint under ballistic load? Are they, you know, what are they doing? I mean, I, there's a number of ways that muscles might stabilize a particular joint. So, um, so you might hear that in certain ways, but specifically what psoas is doing is it is managing lumbar position against the forces of gravity and, and movements. So it is tasked with a really difficult job, specifically in our culture, where we're not walking a lot, we're sitting a whole lot, we're compressing our lumbars a whole lot, those kind of things. Um, you know, it is, it is not really able to stabilize something that's not moving properly. So um, that can be tough. So like I said, this muscle is a tight and extremely effective muscle to treat for just about everything. So that's, that's really great. Quick question, David. Sure. Um, so I know I, I can find my greater trochanter like on my own body, but is there is there a way to locate your lesser trochanter? Like, because I know it's kind of buried. Mm, I love that you're trying to find these landmarks. A great no, you you it, without a scalpel, there is no way. There, so you can you can get to. Uh, so do you remember when we did adductors and we spent a little bit of time finding pectineus? Remember we had to like flex the hip and then we had to find um, the adductor longus tendon that we had to find that. Yeah. Window, feel for Is the it under window. ASIS or? So you, if you remember where we found pectineus, mm -hmm. if you stacked through pectineus, you would hit the psoas iliacus tendon. And if you stacked through that, you'd hit the lesser trochanter. That's how Do you have a video of finding? I, well, when you guys become seniors and you do adductor work, we'll go through that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's adductor work. That's why the seniors have been through that. I um, mean, at the very end of adductor demo, um, if you go through the videos that that were linked by Lee, I'm sure it's on there somewhere. Um, okay, I haven't explored those yet. Yeah, those are if you guys do have free time. I mean, it, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, we we have all this free time, but really, what we're finding is like we we really don't have free time. We just have time to do the things we've been meaning to do for a long time, huh? At least that's what I'm finding. That's um, yes. Yeah, right. It's wild. <laughs> yeah, it is. So when you're doing lying leg lifts where you lift the pelvis off the floor, are the iliopsoas being used as secondary muscles? Okay. Um, so like uh let's talk about that just so on your back, um if so I would push through one heel to lift my pelvis off the floor and then do leg lifts. Um, like you're lying down and you're gonna do like a regular leg lift. Um, except you make sure that your legs go all the way up to 90 degrees and then you 
push your pelvis off the floor a little bit, like kind of with the reach with your legs, with your heels. Okay. Um, so that's doing a couple of things. Uh, is it getting so as a little bit, right? I mean, so as is a muscle that you can, you can bring it to almost every exercise because you're really getting into like this role of like maintaining lumbar position because you know, what happens when we, when we effort against, um, a load that we would consider our threshold is we lose lumbar position. So there's always that opportunity. However, it is also really healthy to, and what I usually give people is like sitting knee raises. I mean, something really simple um, and really functional and really disciplined where all the cues are present because people do all sorts of stuff when they try to access SOAS. So the first thing I would say is there's probably one to 2% of the population where lying leg lifts will work with SOAS. But what's going to happen with most people when they do lying leg lifts to 90 degrees? One, they don't have the range for it. That's first. So 80% of people, they're out. For the other 20%, what 15 to 18% of them are going to do is use their hip flexors. So how do we make sure that they're using psoas and not hip flexors, right? Because it, what's good, what the feedback you'll get from most people on the side they're lifting the leg is they'll point to TFL. They'll point to rectus femoris. They're not going to point in their belly. So are we certain that they are going to control their abdominal wall with leg lifts? Now, the raising of the pelvis is a very interesting way to expose that, but under extremely dynamic load. So as an assessment, this is really poorly designed, although it's not an assessment, it's an exercise. But when you push to that opposite heel, you are, you are creating an unstable pelvic position. And what will happen is you're going to your glutes and you're going to your abdominal wall contralaterally. So you're, you're using the, let's say your right leg is at 90 and your pelvis is lifting up through your left heel. It would be your left glute medius and minimus in contrast with your right uh, abdominal wall. And what will happen with most people is they'll go into a pretty severe rotation. When I say most people, I mean of that 20% that have the range to do it, 19% of them will do this. There's that 1% that has the control and the discipline to keep it right. And that's still not guaranteeing they're in their psoas, but that is an extremely, extremely difficult, and I would go as far to say unnecessary exercise that I don't understand why people are doing it. Um, because that's just like being dynamic to be dynamic. The risk in that exercise, especially with weight, is really high. Um, the possibility of doing it wrong is really high. I'm kind of soapboxing here, Jess. I apologize if I'm saying too much here, but um, that's, that's, there, there's a lot of demand going on there. That's, that's pretty intense. I could probably take that exercise and cut half of the difficulty out and still find problems with most people. I mean, that's, that's a really tough exercise. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but yeah, I think so. But you're talking about the leg lifts where both legs are off the floor. Even just one, no, okay. even just one. So if you're lifting one up, right. So let's say you have two legs out and you lift one up and then you push through that opposite heel. So what's happening is you're asking your pelvis to be stabilized through one side. Now, this is dynamically extremely difficult, right? I mean, to maintain, I mean, just, just try it. Lay on the ground, lift one leg. Don't even worry about 90. Just lift it a little bit off the floor and push through your other heel. And, and notice how much your body wants to go into rotation. It's going to want to rotate immediately, right? Yeah. I mean, it's going to happen to everybody because that's extremely difficult. Because one, you're, you're, you're creating a long lever challenge, right? Meaning if you were to bring the knee up in the air and bring the foot closer to the body, you can imagine that would be much easier. That's a short lever challenge. Now people will often fail that, but that's a heck of a lot easier than straight leg. That's like, I mean, that's a long lever challenge. You're creating a very long distance of effort under a really specific point of fulcrum. So that, that's very hard to do, it's very hard to do. Plus you have a, a leg at 90 degrees. So that, I mean, that's like, again, I don't really, for someone to teach that, I would really want to sit down and wonder and be totally open. Like, look, I don't know everything. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that well, what I'm telling you is, is right. I'm just in my mind and what I understand, I don't get why that exercise would exist. You want to, so, you want to ask them, how does that work? Yeah. 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 So, well, yeah. And, and it's probably like, there's a lot of really, neat elements of that exercise by themselves, but put together, it's just, I think it's way too much. And there are people in the exercise circuit right now that are getting, they're really getting um, very popular off of their ability to create these super dynamic workouts. But the thing is like, 
that should be something behind a closed door for 1% of the population. Yeah, I can't All stand right. those exercises. You know what I mean? Like, they're just too challenging. Like, I mean, if we're talking functionally. I was yeah. like, I was. Go ahead, Nadia. It's okay. Uh, no, sorry. My roommate was trying to burn me down. And, I'm, I'm so lucky you were here, actually. And the whole house is, like, smoky. And I was, like, listening to you, and I looked up, and it's like everything is smoked out. And I'm like, oh, shit. And he comes back in like, I'm sorry. <laughs> so nothing's on fire. Okay. That's good. Sorry. I meant to put myself on mute. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Um. Yeah, and that's always a fun discussion, Jess. I like talking about those things because they are, you know, but if you go to a, a good physical therapist, I don't know that they're ever going to give you that exercise. And I get that some communities, especially in the training world, they're like, oh, this is a great exercise. It gets all these muscles active. Yeah, maybe, unless you have dysfunction, which again, most everybody does. So here's the thing. If you're going to tell me that that's going to engage this right glute left ab dynamic with a leg lift, you have to ensure that the person can do that. Are you doing that? And if not, then what's happening? Because here's the thing. We talked about it before. What is the one thing the lumbar spine does not want to do? Rotate, right? You rotate the lumbar spine under load, you are asking for low back issues. Now, you show me how many people can do that exercise without lumbar rotation. I, I mean, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't think I could do that without lumbar rotation. I mean, that's really tough, maybe for a very short period of time. And then what am I doing with that leg anymore? I'm so focused on keeping my spine stable and unrotated that that leg in the air is doing nothing. I mean, I'm not concentrated on psoas activation. I'm probably compensating with my hip flexors. I just don't, I don't get that exercise. It, it's very confusing to me from a, as a functional guy. I mean, again, I, I don't know if someone's just trying to sweat and get a metabolic workout, but there's a million ways to do that. I don't know. I just don't get it. Personally. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a tough exercise, man. It's tough. I, but you know what? Maybe there's more people that can do it than I think. I don't know. You're in that, you're immersed in the move, the, the training world more than a lot of you guys more than I am. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's like a bunch of people that can do that well. I don't know. Maybe I some of you guys. People don't notice, like now that you're telling me everything involved in it, I'm wondering if when I do it, <clears throat> I wrote it. So that's. Um, no, that's my water. Good thing to wonder. Good thing to wonder, right? And maybe you don't, that's great. But here's the concern is like, are people doing this and leaving with low back pain? And are, are they thinking that's normal? Because you do feel it back there when you're doing that. Yeah, but and that's, that's not... My abs weren't strong enough or something. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. And that's not healthy, right? With that exercise, you shouldn't feel in your low back at all. Like that, that is, that is a, a pelvic girdle, like glute abdominal wall. Like that, that, that's an exercise that you shouldn't feel in your low back especially in a negative way. But I feel like most people that do that probably would. It's like plank. A lot of people do elbow plank and they're like, they, they feel it in their back. And it's like, dude, that, you should not be feeling that in your back. That's not a good exercise for you. Yeah. So Thank you. good chat. Good chat. Any other questions? Uh, yes, David, the last action for psoas, um, proximate lumbar vertebrae towards femur. Can you, can you tell me what that means? Mm, yeah, so I think that's going back to the stability thing. So um, if we look at what most people do, let's go back to this stoop posture idea. If I'm sitting at a desk and I start to round forward, okay, my vertebrae are going to start rounding away from the femur. Can you imagine that happening, Meredith? Your vertebrae are going away from the femur? Yeah, so, think, so if you're, are you sitting down right now? Yes. Okay, so what I want you to do is just go and slump down and let your lumbar spine just give, give away. Do you feel how your lumbars are moving away from your femur? Oh, yes. Okay, yes. so what that's saying is it will fire in those situations to pull them or approximate them back towards neutral. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. gotcha. That's all it's saying. It's less in a position to do that from a deep lordosis. If you have a deep lordosis, it's still going to fire because it's a stabilizer, but mm -hmm. it's not able to pull those vertebrates back. That's more going to be in your multifidian rotators. But it okay. does explain why people with, with hypolordosis, people with really stoop posture, still have a very tight psoas. It, is, it has been spending decades trying to pull those vertebrates back and losing. Um, so it helps to explain. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no problem. 
good questions. Any other questions? Yeah, I know this is going way back, but now that you just mentioned that thoracic lump um, doesn't like to rotate, I kind of mm -hmm. forgot about that. So the thoracic vertebra, um, what is, are they just there like for stability? Like they don't move, they don't really like to move at all. Oh no, so lumbars don't like to rotate. Thoracic love to rotate. They're built for rotation. They're extremely good rotators. Um, but the facets, if you look at the facet, we'll go over this in spine, the facets or the joints in the lumbars are vertical. So they're built to move forward and back, but they do not rotate very much. Very okay. limited rotation in the lumbars. Got the, it. Okay. The thoracic, the facets are like this. So they love to rotate. There isn't a lot of room to go forward and back. Yeah. Um, okay. I knew that about thoracic, just not long. I was confused about the lumbar. Yeah, lumbar limited rotation. So whenever you create a lot of rotation, especially in the lower lumbar, the term they use is called shearing. And lumbar shearing is, when you hear that term, it's never good news. You never want lumbar shearing. So this is why hip mobility is really important in exercise because your low back will suffer otherwise. Um, and this is why abdominal control of your extremities is really important. And that's where that exercise comes in is you're doing something really dynamic with your extremities and you're asking your abdominal wall to control that. And if it can't, it is going to lose into rotation every time. I mean, you, so next time you go to the gym, Jess, are you training at all? You're, you're not, you're just doing exercise. Um, like right now. Yeah. Oh, um, I'll work out at home <laughs> as much as oh. I can without like, a barbell <laughs> yeah yeah but generally do you i mean i'm not not like outside of this this viral situation are you training in a gym or no oh yeah i go to the gym yeah so are you training other people no okay okay i was gonna say if you do have them do that and see how many people don't rotate okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah or sure. even just on yourself like you seem you seem like like you're you're pretty strong like can you do that without rotating it's very hard that's a really tough thing to do yeah yeah, it's really tough. And, okay. and, and, and granted, it's light load. Like, you know, I would say it's probably moderate risk. I wouldn't necessarily classify it as high risk. But it is a moderate risk activity that I'm not really sure what the reward is. If you're trying to increase glute and abdominal bracing, either it's there or it's not. And if it's not there in that exercise, how are you improving it? So my, my principal rule, and this is why PT, bad PTs fail, is they're not good at progressing out and in of exercises. So most people I do that with, I feel like I would have to progress them backwards out of that. And then maybe after a couple of years of really great core exercise and focus, maybe they can evolve to that. But that's, again, that's super tough, man. I feel like, I don't know, maybe I'm off, but I'm not, I'm not working with... Um, the kind of population that might nail that on a regular basis. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I mean, functionally, it'd be interesting to see how many people compensate with everything else except what they should actually use to do that exercise correctly. Absolutely. And then the next question is if they do compensate, what next? Do you keep them in that exercise or do you progress them backwards? That's the big question. And to me, you progress them out of it. Yeah. Because I agree. they will continue to, to access those compensatory habits and they will deepen them. So you have to be able to pull somebody out of an exercise and say, hey, this just isn't for you right now. Let's try some more simple things and let's, let's have that as a goal. And it doesn't matter if they want to hear that or not. Like that's just what needs to happen yeah. for their health, right? Because injury will slow you down more than anything. So you drop back and you get functional and then you work your way back up. Um, Ido Portal, man, um, He's, he's really, he, I love his perspective on movement and he's an extraordinary mover. I don't know if you want, if you want to watch somebody move the way everybody should move, watch this guy. He's unreal. Um, Can you write his name down in the chat? Absolutely. Um, but I will actually, um, while we're on the subject, let me see if I can find, I seem to have bad luck finding videos. Um, when we're in these discussions, but I was going to say a quote that he does, um, but I might as well just show it to you because it is so spot on when it comes to movement. Um, and it was a video he did on, uh, paleo, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, this one. I, let me see if I can just find the blurb. 
Come on with the commercials, man. Come on. Okay, I'm going to screen share this, and because I, I think this is the part, but this dude, I mean, if you want to watch somebody move well, watch this guy. It is pretty extraordinary how well he moves. Um, but there's this part where he talks about how we should think about movement. I think this is the part here. We've been known to move people around and out of city, which creates a lot of the modern problems and, and putting them back into this very basic resting human position, the squat. Some refer to it as the paleo chair. When I travel through Indonesia, people around and out of... Hold on, it's, it's back. Mover, here we go. This is the part here. Mover and then the whole way that you work your body. And uh, you can take this into any small isolated discipline. But the movement approach kind of moves you a little bit backwards and widen the spectrum. Where you observe what, what kind of possibilities the body has and explore them, develop yourself as a mover and then as a specialist. So I coined a phrase that goes homo sapiens first, homo motus, the mover, second, homo specialitas, third. You're a surfer. But first, you're a human being, and also, you're a mover below being a surfer. So you still need to squat down, pick up your child, or a, a play frisbee in the park in the weekend, or have a healthy spine, which might not come from uh, your isolated discipline. So I notice you're moving around a little bit while we're talking here as well. Anyway, just that part right there I love, because it really brings some light to what it is that I'm talking about, which is, um, I, I sent that private, let me resend that publicly. Um, which is that, you know, we tend to look at specialties as, as baselines for how movement should happen or what it is to be athletic or what it is to be fit, but we forget to look at the progressions properly. So when we get most people, they want to specialize. I want to, be a, a participant in yoga or I want to be a participant in CrossFit, which is a specialization, but how are they as humans and as movers first? Right. And that's, that is the big question that goes into your ability to be great at any specialization is what is the foundation? How are you as a mover? If you're not good as a mover, you will not be good as a specialist. There is some leverage in that statement. L l let me asterisk that. I mean, there are some people that maybe poor movers in some ways that can still do some specialties well, but there will be a limit and there is still a higher risk. Does that make sense? Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's a lot of people that can do a lot that people would consider fit. Um, but the way in which they do it is absolutely horrible. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I agree. And again, the way this dude moves, like I, I just want to show a short video of this guy because it is Unreal. And he really tries the discipline. Now you can train with this guy. It's very expensive. I have a few friends that have trained with some of his students and it's very expensive, but um, there's some programs. He's based out of Israel, but just show this video. It's a four and a half minute video, but if you want to watch how movement should happen, this, this is it. Why should we move? Why do we move in complex ways? Well, movement complexity is by far the reason why we became the reason for our brain development and our departure and ascent to the top of the food chain is related to movement complexity. So I have a news flash for you. You are the best movers on the planet. So bro, what kind of muscles you have? No. Bro, what kind of patterns you have? Can you flip? Can you invert? Can you crawl? Or is it just aesthetics? My name is Ito Portal. I grew up in a kind of a physical lifestyle from the start. Slowly throughout the practice and transitioning between arts and exploring capoeira, exploring other fields, I got into the realization that uh, it's movement that I'm passionate about. Basically, we are all teachers. Whether you like it or not, you are a teacher all the time. 
So somebody copies you, you're a teacher. Somebody stops you in the street, asks you for directions, you become the teacher. It's something that is a piece of a human culture, being a teacher and then also being a student. Information is toxic and it's addictive and we run after it. We have this thirst for information. But at a certain point, it turns on you and uh, paralyzes you. It freezes you up and it doesn't allow you to apply and learn and it's not after for your development. First, aesthetics is reverse engineering. Concentrating on aesthetics is reverse engineering, which usually fails. Trying to reverse engineer a, a proficient body movement, a mover, a body of a mover, and only putting the aesthetics of it. It's similar to a nose that is not meant for breathing. Of course, it has a price. And you end up empty, you end up sick, you end up immobile because you're not pursuing movement and you're pursuing just the looks of it, just the aesthetics. For the upper body, I definitely view the best piece of equipment, the gymnastics rings. It's not the bar. It's not the dumbbells, it's not the cable, it's not the machines. It's not also the dip and, and, and pull-up bars and the station at the, at the park. It is the gymnastics rings. The most clever contraption for building an upper body human physique. I think nothing even comes close. Start to think about things in a more general scheme. Go to some disciplines study some disciplines, go take up gymnastics, take up capoeira, take up some martial arts, take up dance, play around, do parkour, do some break dancing, do whatever you can. How can you get a hold of us? Well, first our website www.idoportal.com, sign in, join the movement culture, you will get a lot of updates. So yeah, a little, little bit of a, of a mini plug there, but uh, just an extraordinary mover, man. He's a guy that I go to a lot to get inspired about, um, you know, playing around with movement. And yeah, he, it's super strong and uh, such a diverse, you know, doesn't limit himself to one thing. And, um, you know, you, you guys are probably familiar with Conor McGregor, but when Conor McGregor got on, on a streak, Ido was the guy he brought in to train him. There's all these videos of him training Conor McGregor um because connor knew he needed something a little bit different so he's he's an expensive guy to train with but uh man his movement capacity is pretty wild and i like the way he his, his philosophy around movement is really inspiring too so anyway wanted to share that with you guys uh you can dive into more of his stuff he's got a lot of youtube material um he's got a page you can follow and he uploads posts and some really neat stuff you can just do at home you know it's not all super complicated but it's nice to see what the human body is capable of. I don't aspire to do half the stuff that I just watched or 90% of it, but some elements of that would be great. <laughs> it's just Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> for sure. And the other thing to keep in mind too with a guy like that is you understand he wakes up at six and all he does is move all day. So don't feel like like he earned that like big time. That's, that's if you want to move like that, you it has to be your job, like full time. Yeah, I agree. It's got to be all you do, so. Um, the perfect mixture between strength and range of motion. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Mobility, flexibility, and power, strength, the whole combination, like being able to display that. There's so many people that are that can move a lot of weight that can't, you know, hang with their arm behind their back or do a handstand or how this is, yeah, it's that the balance between all of it that's really good. And you know, when you watch videos of him training standard people, he does a lot of interesting stuff. Like he'll take you to the park and have you walk down a rail like it's a, like it's a beam and just learn to trust your proprioception. Like he starts with weird stuff like that. But he's big into that lizard crawl. He really starts with that with a lot of people. Um, some of the spinal mobility pieces I share with people, I totally stole from him because they're so good. 
um, yeah, so yeah, great guy to check out. So um, that's close. That's more like a, a dying lizard is what that looks like. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do now, uh, if you have no more questions about the muscles, I would like to have us all, if, if some of you guys already did your quiz, great. I want to give time for some people who haven't done it to do it. So I'm going to say it's 10-10 it's right now. Um, let's take 20 minutes to look at that quiz. So I'm just going to take, we're going to take a break. You guys look through it. Um, 10 questions, you just A, B, C, or D, and then we're going to talk through it. And then I'm going to show the, the new muscles and then we'll be done. So let's meet, uh, so let's say 1035. That gives you uh, 25 minutes with that quiz. Did anybody not get the quiz? I've just resent it as a PDF. So either the Word or the PDF version should work. All right, great. I'll see you guys back at 1035.